taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Henri Landru. Bluebeard. The legend of Bluebeard is one that is present in many cultures, the man who marries numerous women and then kills them afterwards. In late 19th century France, a modern day Bluebeard emerged, Henri Landru, a fraudster who ensnared 11 women and murdered them ultimately so he could sell their possessions and cash in on their savings. Henri Desire Landru was born in Paris in 1869, the son of a fireman at a local iron works. He studied at the School of Mechanical Engineering before enlisting in the army, where he achieved the rank of sergeant. In 1893, Landru married a cousin with whom he'd already had a daughter, and in 1894, he left the army and returned to civilian life. His next act worthy of note, was being convicted of fraud and sent to prison for the first of seven times, reportedly attempting to commit suicide during his incarceration. By the beginning of World War I, Landru and his first wife had separated, although they remained married. This however, did not prevent Landru from embarking on a series of liaisons with generally vulnerable women, which also resulted in their disappearances and his own personal enrichment. Although not a handsome man, he seemed capable of sweeping women off their feet with his intelligence, quick wit and silver tongue, and whilst he was killing and robbing his female victims, he continued to defraud recently discharged soldiers of their pensions too, he had a variety of scams and cons. Landrieu would usually find his victims through an advert placed in a newspaper. The first of these appeared in 1914 and read. Widower with two children, aged 43, with comfortable income, serious and moving in good society, desires to meet widow with a view to matrimony. 39-year-old Madame Clushet, who had a 16-year-old son, André, answered Landrieu's advert. Landrieu introduced himself to her as Monsieur Dyard, and through his charm and intellect, M's Clochette saw an opportunity to escape her life of drudgery, working in a lingerie shop in Paris. Their relationship was not without its problems however, and on one occasion when they had fallen out, she arrived at his house in the company of some members of her family to try and sort things out. Dyard, otherwise known as Henri Landrieu, was not home, but they went into the house anyway and had a look around. Her brother-in-law opened a chest that he found to contain numerous letters from women to Dyard. He tried to persuade his sister-in-law that this was proof that her lover was a fraud, but she would not listen. She chose Dyard over her family and became estranged from them, soon moving to a villa outside Paris. Madame Clochette and her son were never seen again after January of 1915, and around this time, Landry deposited 5,000 francs in his personal bank account. This was likely taken from Madame Clochette. Madame Laborde Line was the widow of an Argentinian hotelier, and she had informed friends that she was going to remarry. Her new fiance was a Brazilian engineer. Not long after, she announced that the wedding was taking too long to organize and that she was moving in with him anyway. She was never seen again after heading to Landrieu's villa at Vernuelet. Landrieu was later seen at her house collecting her furniture, some of which he kept, with the remainder going into storage. This period would be a busy time for Henri Landrieu. Just a month later, Madame Marie Gillen, a 51-year-old widow, answered an advert and traveled to Vernuilla to meet him. She then moved out of her apartment shortly after, putting her furniture into storage, and moved into Landrieu's villa. Two days later, a furniture removal van moved her furniture to Landrieu's garage at Neuilly. On this occasion, he was calling himself George's Betty, and claimed to be Ams Gillen's brother-in-law. He told people that inquired, that she had become paralyzed and had asked him to take care of her affairs. He then sold her bonds and used forged documents to get his hands on the 12,000 francs in her account at the Bank de France. Henri Landrieu was a very smooth operator indeed, and not just with the ladies. In December of 1916, 
Landru moved to a new villa in the northern French village of Gambe I. The first thing he did was to have a huge cast iron oven installed and order a large quantity of coal. Then, using the name Dubont, he became acquainted with a widow nine years older than him, Madame Heon. Nine months later he was arranging the sale of her furniture. She had not been seen since December, but her friends had received postcards from her through Dubont. Another advertisement brought him into contact with Madame Colomb. She thought she was meeting a Monsieur Clochette, which appears to be a recycled name from an earlier victim. This murder fraud did not work out for Landry straight away however, and the couple separated for a year. Meeting up again she persuaded him to meet her family, who took an instant dislike to the man in her life. Madame Colomb ignored them and moved in with Clochette, but after Christmas, her family lost contact with her. She had vanished off the face of the earth. In 1917, Landry disposed of 19-year-old servant girl, Andre Babelay, but it is unclear why. She had no money and had disappeared en route to her mother's house. Apparently Henri Landrieu had found her crying on a metro platform and she had told him about Rose she'd had with her mother, and was also about to lose her job. Landrieu took her back to his room in Rue de Maubourg and a couple of months later, she told her mother that she was getting married. She traveled out to Gambia at the end of March and the stove was lit. She was never seen again. Soon Landrieu was courting Celestine Boisson, a wealthy widow. They had been writing to each other for two years before she finally met him. Using the name of Fremiet he manipulated her affairs in such a way, that she became estranged from her family. The process was similar to his first victim Madame Clochette. Boisson moved to be with him at Gambay while abandoning her son, who went to live with an aunt. After April of 1917, Madame Buisson was never seen again and Landry's bank account had been augmented by 1,000 francs. Louise Lepoldini Jume disappeared in September of 1917, and around this time, neighbors began to complain about the thick, smelly, smoke that often emerged from Landry's chimney. Landrieu had met him Jom through a matrimonial agency and benefited to the tune of almost 2,000 francs from her disappearance. The financial motives to Henri Landry's murderous crimes were very clear. Anne-Marie Pascal moved in with him as he used the name Forrest. Before long he was selling her furniture, and even had help from Madame Pascal's son to do so. In spring of 1918, it was the turn of Marie Therese Smarketer to become Landrieu's victim. She had been a performer on the stage, known as La Belle Mathies. Now retired, she was running a small guesthouse at 330 Rue Saint-Jacques, which she wanted to sell for 7,000 francs. The two became friends and Landrieu proposed to her in January of 1919. They moved out to Gambay where he persuaded her to sell her possessions. Marketer then sold her furniture in Paris for 2,000 francs and returned to Landrieu. Little did she know, her lover had recently placed a large order for coal. Marketer vanished soon after, as did her two dogs. Meanwhile, Henri Landrieu maintained a pretense that his victims were still alive, sending postcards and letters to family members and associates. In the case of Madame Jome, he presented himself as her lawyer claiming that she was divorcing her husband and therefore closed her bank accounts. Landrieu withdrew her money in the process. When Madame Boisson's son died two years after his mother had gone off with Landrieu, the Boisson family wanted to contact her to inform her of his death. Recalling that she had said she was running off to Gambay with a Monsieur Gillette, her sister Mademoiselle Lacoste wrote to the mayor of the village asking for help in finding either Madame Boisson, or Monsieur Gillette. The mayor of course, had never heard of them, but suggested that she make contact with the family of the Madame Colomb, who had disappeared in similar circumstances. Madame Colomb had of course met Landry shortly before her vanishing event early in 1917. The net would now be starting to close in on Henri Landry. 
Suspicions were aroused in Paris and the local community, so police paid a visit to Landru's estate, Villa Armitage. He had fled already however, leaving behind a series of aliases, Messieurs Styard, Dupont, and Fremiet. This disappearance was not enough for Mademoiselle Lacoste however, she was a very determined lady. She had actually met her sister's boyfriend and thought she would recognize him if she were to see him again. So she began looking for him in the streets of Paris, close to where he used to live. Finally, in 1919, she saw him coming out of a dry goods shop with 27-year-old Fernand Segret. She tried to follow them closely, but lost them in the crowds thronging the streets. Returning to the shop where she had seen Landru, she learned that his name was Gillette and that he lived on the Rue de Rochicourt. She informed the police who went immediately to his apartment and arrested him. When they picked him up, they noticed that he tried to keep possession of a black notebook. It was not surprising that he did not want to part with it, it was filled with notes on all of his victims. Police then searched the grounds of the Villa Armitage and the house but found only the bones of some dogs in the oven ashes. Some other bone splinters turned up, and they found some clothing and legal papers belonging to his victims, but it wasn't much to go on. Henri Landry's trial began two and a half years later on the 7th of November, 1921, at the court of Versailles. It would be one of the most sensational trials in the history of French criminal law. Henri Landry, who had been determinedly uncooperative with police in their investigations, maintained his innocence throughout. The women, he claimed, had merely been business clients of his and that anyway, as not one body had been found, how could he possibly be tried for murder? His neighbors gave an indication of what had happened to his victims however, describing in court the acrid black smoke that used to swirl out of his chimney at regular intervals. One neighbor said that he had seen Landry throw something into a pond near his house, while another claimed that he had been fishing in the pond and had caught something that resembled putrid human flesh on the end of his line. Unlike desensitized contemporary culture, the detailed statements shocked the court. Meanwhile, Landry repeatedly refused to answer the court's questions, claiming that it was nothing to do with anyone else what he knew in regards to the women's disappearances. He also believed that because he had been judged sane, he would be acquitted. I have nothing to say, he would say repeatedly, during his hours of questioning in front of the jury. Although he was a charmer and confidence trickster, his actions didn't rub off too well in the court. The jury reacted badly to his evasions and the sarcasm with which he greeted some questions, taking only two hours to reach their verdict, that he was guilty of the murder of eleven women. Henri Landry was sentenced to death by guillotine. In February of 1922, Landry said his farewells to his legal team and presented them with a drawing he had crafted, while awaiting the date of his execution. After this, Henri Landry knelt down, and the blade fell on the neck of one of the most infamous murderers in France's history. Landry never admitted to his crimes and did not explain how he had carried them out. He also never expressed even a little remorse for the weak and vulnerable women whose lives he had taken. Forty years later, the daughter of one of Landrieu's defense lawyers was examining the picture that Landrieu had given her father all those years before. It had been hanging on the wall of his office ever since. Looking closely she spotted some words scribbled on its frame. They read, I did it. I burned their bodies in the kitchen stove. Finally, in death, Henri Landrieu had confessed.